And I thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name's John, and Kelly is back there, and welcome to Coast Street Arts. This is our first artist talk, and so we were very thankful to Ian to be in our guinea pig, so something goes awry. <laughs> Blame, blame it on us in our, our first try here. Um, and we also want to thank uh, Bruce Brown, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight for uh, curating the show. Um, and we have absolutely loved uh, showing Ian's work. Uh, it is beautiful, uh, visually interesting, and often wickedly funny, which is probably one of my favorite parts. <laughs> uh, Ian uh, has a, perhaps an unlikely path to uh, becoming an artist, uh, you know, uh, getting a degree in the biological sciences at Bowdoin, and being uh, a technician in several uh, laboratories before deciding to become an artist. Uh, and I will uh, spoil his story on how we get to the side collages. And uh, I just, again, want to say welcome and thank you, Ian. Thanks, John. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out to Co Street Arts on First Friday. Uh, I'm Ian Trask, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about my work. Uh, quick question, can everyone hear me? All right? All right. A little louder? Not quite. All right. I'll, I'll try to be a little bit louder, but I'm generally a pretty quiet person, so. Um, right now, I have an ex exhibition of photographic prints and sculptural collages up in the other room. Uh, while this body of work, which I call my Strange History series, is something that I've been producing since 2013. It's a bit of departure from the work that I usually make. Uh, later in this talk, I'll definitely go into it in further detail, uh, but first I want to put it into the larger context of the rest of my work, and I want to show you a little bit, out, uh, a little bit else of what else I do. Um, I'll leave time at the end for some questions, but feel free to ask as we go along if anything comes up. So any artist in the room has probably heard this question a million times. Oh, you're an artist, what kind of work do you make? Uh, my typical response is, I'm a sculptor and I make art out of waste. Admittedly, this is a pretty vague answer that doesn't paint a very full picture of all of my artwork, but it's succinct and uh, it truthfully describes the common denominator present throughout all of my creative directions. The motivating force behind my work is the abundance of waste that humanity generates which is an existential threat to both our species and the planet itself. With that premise as a baseline, I've developed a creative method that deliberately minimizes the material demand I place on that already overloaded system by gaining access to the waste streams around me and then using that waste as a source of material and conceptual inspiration. The seed for this idea came to me back in 2007 when I was in the process of transitioning away from my original career path in science research. For a brief time, I got a job as a groundskeeper at a nearby hospital. I was trying to make enough money to afford the move to Brooklyn, New York. One of my routine tasks at this job was picking up the litter that was regularly dropped on the ground and in the parking lot by the people that worked there and the people visiting the hospital. Obviously, picking up garbage wasn't my ideal way to utilize my expensive biology degree from Bowdoin College, but the cocktail of emotions that define that activity, sadness, frustration, anger, and disappointment, would become the fuel that fed the fire that would ultimately become my artistic passion. I began training my eyes to notice all the waste that surrounded me, from the obvious to the way less noticeable. What quickly became apparent was that this was a free and inexhaustible resource. After only a few months on the groundskeeping job, I moved to New York City to begin the nebulous pursuit of becoming an artist. My first full-time job was working as an in-house picture framer at an art gallery. It didn't take me long to start incorporating the copious amounts of waste generated on the job into my artwork. Leftover lengths of wood molding were a really common find. I would often stay after work and construct empty frames that I would later fill with other materials. For some pieces, the frame would come first before even the idea materialized. The size and dimensions of the finished artwork was dictated by the sizes of the lengths of wood molding that I got access to. We commonly generated thin little scraps of gessoed fabric when we had to stretch prints on canvas or linen. 
we would clean up the margins by cutting off these thin scraps. While standard procedure was to throw out this waste byproduct, I, on the other hand, felt compelled to save and use them. Sometimes I would even paint these coiled pieces of textiles before assembling them into their frames. Uh, this piece called barcode is constructed from razor blades, which are common consumable materials in pretty much any frame shop. I was that guy who routinely went rummaging through a bin of used blades looking for inspiration while other people only saw this as a place of danger. Here's a close-up of that piece. Uh, during this time, I also started working with plastic packaging, which was generated when we had to buy an occasional shop tool. I saw beauty in their forms and would use them as invisible textured layers and framed collages. For this piece, I took a package for CFL light bulbs, masked off some areas with tape, spray painted the inside, and then filled it with plastic bags. Any trip to a corner store in New York City and you'll probably end up with a, a fun plastic bag with a, a yellow smiley face on it, so if you've been there you might recognize the contents. Here's another example of a similar piece, uh, this one made with a package that came with some kitchen knives. In addition to plastic bags, sometimes I would fill the packages with paper, metallic framing waste, and other miscellaneous materials that I might find in and around the frame shop. So in this particular piece, you can see uh, a cut up tape measure. Up here, you can see um, various components when you disassemble frames or stretcher bars or these hardware that you can't load back into machines. So it was something that would generally get thrown in the garbage can. Uh, Top left, you have diamond dust, which is a, a material used in screen printing, so these tiny little glass shards. And in the bottom left, there's kind of cut up pieces of mylar, which was another material that I came across in the shop. During this period, I spent so much time thinking about framing that I would sometimes see picture frames in everyday objects. Like this piece, for example, one day I came across a boxy television being thrown away on the sidewalk and dismantled it on the spot. I left the guts there but took the plastic phase back to the shop and turned it into this piece. The colorful contents are actually chopped up and scrambled porno magazines, thus the title, Kill and Fuck Your Television. In tandem with my exploration of framed collages, I started working pretty seriously with cardboard. After all, it was so ubiquitous on the job and out on the street. Because of how available it was, cardboard became my go-to material for large-scale sculptural installations. I installed this piece in my first jury group show in New York City. I made it by pleating and stitching together numerous large cardboard boxes. I built this site-specific installation for an outdoor arts festival. It's constructed similarly to a wood pile, so anyone in Maine here I'm sure is familiar with this. Uh, there's hundreds of cardboard logs. Um, they were brought to the site and laid in formation and held together just by friction and compression. Uh, this piece, uh, similar to the one I just showed you, was a 15 foot tall freestanding sculpture at a Brooklyn gallery. Uh, to build it, I included some wood framing to give it shape and stability and then concealed the wood framing with smaller rolls of cardboard. Uh, this installation is significant because it documents how I was starting to encourage people to physically interact with my work. There's something about art made from familiar materials that are obviously not precious that opens the door of accessibility. Without the pretense of grandeur, people feel more comfortable touching the art. For this piece, called Giant Steps, I turn my cardboard rolls on their ends and ask gallery, go gallery goers to walk across it. As I showed my work more and more, I gradually began to connect with my community through the context of creative reuse. It became apparent that people were eager to participate in my process, either by donating things or, rel or relinquishing things that they had been saving but had never found a use for. I absolutely love this aspect of my process because it indicates to me that my work is not only memorable but meaningful. My work was inspiring individuals to change their personal behavior. 
This was an extremely important development for me. The social impact that, I, that I'd always wanted to find working in the science field was manifesting itself through my artwork. I was discovering the power and potential of creative suggestion. With this development came a new phase in my work. The floodgates opened and a whole new host of materials flowed into my studio. In this, in this respect, the people around me impacted the direction of my work by way of the materials they gave me. Pictured now is a piece I made with 900 colored plastic Pantone swatches. These objects were gifted to me by a friend who was a product designer. He thought they were really cool and had been saving them for years, but had finally come to terms with the fact that he was never going to do anything with them. Uh, this piece is made from 5,000 whittled matches. Uh, my roommate at the time worked for a film company that had produced branded matchboxes in, in order to promote an upcoming film. Their overproduction of this promo tool meant that I had a ser seriously fun material to play with. Uh, in case you're wondering, uh, the dark lettering in this piece were made by pre-burning those matches before setting them into the frame. Um, if I started the other way around, I probably would have burnt my studio down. Uh, at some point, I started working with piano keys. Uh, after a coworker brought a box of piano parts to the studio, thinking that, thinking that I would find something to do with them. Here's another piece made with piano parts, but in this case, I use the hammers that strike the strings rather than the piano keys. There's also some sheet music behind that, which was another material I came across in the studio. This piece was commissioned by a good friend of mine. Uh, he asked me to make something using his mother-in-law's super fun collection of wild bird feathers. Um, like the previous two examples, it includes piano parts, and it in itself resembles a bird's feather. So I had another friend who was a veterinarian that hated to throw away the used vaccine vials that his vet's office generated. <laughs> Despite being technically a biohazard material, their colorful metal caps made them interesting to look at. Now, Dr. Ken promised me that these were harmless, and, uh, and I trusted him. I still don't have rabies, so I guess he was right. This is a close-up of that piece, um, or of a dis different piece, actually. Um, as you can see, I didn't use just the colorful caps. It's the entire bottles that are included inside the frames. Sometimes you come across a collection of material that just screams of potential. One opportune group show happened at an emerging art space in Brooklyn that was a textile factory in a former life. The space was called the Invisible Dog, taking its name from a gimmicky toy that was invented there in the 1980s. Prior to making fake dog leashes, the factory produced various fashion accessories, including elastic belts, suspenders, and jewelry. I got a brief tour of the building at the opening, and in a cavernous back room, I laid eyes on an incredible collection of multicolored elastic belts, wall-to-wall -wall storage shelves of this wonderful material. I was immediately drawn to it and worked up the nerve to approach the gallery owner to see if there's any way I could get some of it. Turns out he was willing to give it away to artists so long as they gave something back in return. This conversation sparked a friendship and the beginning of a new chapter in my life. Shortly after, I found myself with keys to the building, a dusty corner in the basement to work in for free, and, um, and all the material I could want. So at this point, I started to frequently include the colored elastic in my work. At first, it became a time-saving replacement for the hand-painted linen that I had been using earlier. Eventually, I started creating new visual motifs with the material. This piece, titled Lola's Fourth Symphony, was made collaboratively with a bunch of young kids at a four-year-old's birthday party. Just to be clear, I was part of the hired help, for, or the hired entertainment for that birthday party. Sometimes I would find interesting wood panels to adhere the elastic to. For instance, this board here was tossed away after being used to test a screen print at a print shop run by some friends. They told me I could use it so long as I adequately obscured the white printed image. If you can't tell what was originally there, then I say I succeeded. 
this piece was mounted onto the wooden frame for a mirror that I pulled out of a dumpster near my studio building. And then this one here is another example, this time on a discarded door from the roof deck of my workplace. I also found the elastic material to be ideal for large-scale wall-mounted installations. This piece, called Fabric of the Cosmos, is installed permanently in the main gallery space of the Invisible Dog. It was a gift to the art community there, made in exchange for their generous support and one and a half years of free studio space. In the years since, I've continued to make numerous other textile murals like this, although all the subsequent ones were only temporary. When the show runs their course, I deinstall the elastic material and save it for use in future projects. This particular piece was a 30 foot long, was 30 feet long, and was created on site without any prior designing. It's important to note, even though I'm especially fond of this material, I fully understand that it's a finite resource. I've managed to hoard a lot of it, and I continue to save and recycle it when I can. But once, I, once my stash runs dry, I don't plan on buying any more of it. Either that body of work is over, or it's dormant until I can find a similar material. In 2014, I was offered an incredible opportunity, a solo show at the Invisible Dog. I knew it would be a challenge, because the gallery is a raw, irregular space. And I wouldn't have the luxury of copious clean white walls to work with, but instead, tons of open floor space in a room with 14 foot tall ceilings. So, how do you go about building something of monumental scale from found waste materials, whose quantities are largely out of your control? It would be a hell of a lot simpler if you could just allow yourself to buy all the required materials, right? But personally, I want to work within certain sourcing constraints, which means that I have to first determine a material's availability. If I, can th if I think I can get enough of something, then I can begin to dream up a project using that material. After a bunch of brainstorming, I found myself returning to thermoform plastic packaging. The more I looked into the material, the more I realized how much of a nuisance it was. After a research trip to the Sims Recycling Facility, which, which handles the majority of New York City's curbside recycling, I learned that thermoform plastic is really difficult to recycle and is thus often just discarded. It's also, by design, it's also meant to be invisible and ignored, which meant that it lives largely in the blind side, in the blind spot of everyday consumers. Although its prevalence is undeniable. With a deadline of seven months until the exhibition, I took a gamble on my ability to source thousands of packages from my community. One way I did this was by creating these collection bins and placing them throughout the city. You can see that I screen printed a boiled down description of the project onto the, pro onto the box so that people could easily grasp what it was I was asking for. So at this point, I began to really lean into my followers. I asked help from everyone I could think of, not just for their plastic packages, but for their advice, for their help spreading the word about my projects, for their network connections, and ultimately their financial support in a Kickstarter campaign. Utilizing these connections, I even collaborated with a local elementary school and numerous local businesses. PS321 in Park Slope, Brooklyn, allowed me to be part of their Green and Healthy initiative, which meant I did a hands-on demonstration at a school event and collected plastic packages outside the school at morning drop-off once a week for a whole month. I needed to build momentum fast in order to accumulate enough material so that I could get to work constructing the piece. One hitch at the time was that my humble studio was only 100 square feet and already full of art and unused art supplies. I was lucky enough to find a last minute Hail Mary residency opportunity at an amazing space in Brooklyn called Pioneer Works. This residency, which I had for four months, was absolutely crucial. It provided enough space to build the sculpture and was the perfect setting to increase public awareness. The whole process was a real nail biter to the very end. Uh, by sheer hard work and miraculous outpouring of support from my community, I finished the project in time for my exhibition deadline. 
The finished installation was a 16 foot by 16 foot by 14 foot tall monumental plastic tomb. Roughly 5,000 post-consumer packages were removed from the local waste stream and stitched together with countless copper wires stripped from discarded ethernet cables. These cables were also donated by my community. So the piece actually had two doors on it so you could enter inside and this is a view from inside the piece. During the run of the show, I tried to maximize exposure and community involvement by coordinating two evenings of music and dance performances. These events were a great chance to observe how people interacted with the piece, not just as passive gallery goers, but also as active participants. Uh, right now I'm gonna play a short video to give you more insight into the project. I store green on Paul Street in Brooklyn, down by the Navy Yard. It's where I've been storing the blister pack project after I finished it. Um, so here's, here's all the panels of the project stacked unceremoniously. In my mind, I was kind of blown away by how easily people could just throw something on the ground. How can you possibly believe that the ground is the appropriate place for this thing? How is there such a high volume of things being discarded on the ground? Like, what is, what's triggering, what's causing people to do this? Making the invisible visible to people was sort of what prompted the, the Blister Pact project, which was actually taking an invisible material, a clear material, and trying to get people to actively see it. It's important for me to find a way to source any project I'm, I'm making in a, in a way that sort of fits my, my procedure. You know, like find a way to get material that doesn't require me paying a lot of money or sort of asking for new production to be made to create the material I need. I ended up deciding that I wanted to use thermoform plastic. It's a material I've been using for a handful of years. Started out as just individual packages that I would take, see some sort of beauty in the package itself. And, you know, I, I saw them and I was like, I'm pretty sure there's, I should be able to withdraw thousands of these from the community. I know it's a nuisance material. Um, and as I did more research into it, learned more about how much of a nuisance it is and how difficult it is to, to properly sort and recycle and why that complication means it frequently goes to landfill rather than being reprocessed. And uh, slowly just started to, to make people aware of what I was trying to do. I wanted to outright call it a plastic tomb, but I knew that sort of the negative element of that might hinder my, the initial response. So I was kind of trying to keep that out of it, even though deep down I was like, it is a plastic tomb, you know, but it's, it's, it's sort of symbolic of us burying ourselves in our own wastes, you know? And eventually I kind of, I leveled it out and called it a monument because it's, I, I wanted to like have an interpretation to it, you know, like you can read it as a tomb and it kind of, it resembles mausoleums and like it utilizes sort of this reference to hieroglyphics through the, the shapes of the packages and kind of tries to tell a narrative through these forms. But I wanted it to be more like a monument to this effort that this community made to, to kind of try to be more aware about this thing and it sort of commemorates this experience and kind of ties all of us into it. Maybe you were on the brink of destruction and you kind of turned, changed your course and this thing kind of became a hallmark of, of change instead of foolishness.
So Blister Packed was an example of a project in which I targeted a specific material. That's not always how the donation process works though. If I want my community to donate materials, I need to let them do it in their own way. One difficulty with this is that what I'm given isn't always aesthetically interesting, at first glance at least, but because a symbiotic partnership with my community is core to my work, I don't want to discourage any form of donation simply because I don't see any potential, any potential right off the bat. To overcome this roadblock, I increasingly rely on a process of binding miscellaneous objects in yarn. In the beginning, I saw it as a small-scale solution to quickly and effectively consume or trap a collection of materials. I called the finished sculptures spores because I believe them to be, I see them as conceptual seeds, reminders to notice the material detritus of our modern landscape. Over time, this method became a more robust catch-all process for almost any material. The size of the spore or the intrigue of the original material were less important than the overall accumulation of bound objects. In 2017, I was invited by Bethany Engstrom, associate curator at the CMCA, to include my spore sculptures in their themed exhibition, Materiality. This was an exciting opportunity because it exposed my work and my mission to the wider audience of Maine. A bit later, I had a breakthrough moment while doing a residency at Mass Mocha where for the first time I tried suspending the spores. This was an important development. Now the small, generic, and less commanding spores could occupy space in a more meaningful way because they weren't so obviously dwarfed by the larger objects. In the year following, I experimented on this new direction and created two site-specific installations, one in Brunswick and one in Brooklyn. This installation at the Frank Brockman Gallery in Brunswick, called Waste Stream, had over 400 suspended spores, and I encouraged visitors to touch the artwork. They enjoyed trying to recognize what the spores were made of, and being allowed to touch the work added a layer to that identification process. The next iteration, Waste of Space, was designed specifically for a unique glass house gallery at the Invisible Dog. It's pretty much the same number of spores as the Frank Brockman Gallery, just oriented differently in space. Similarly, people were allowed to walk inside and explore the spores and get up close and touch them. So now you're probably a bit curious how all this connects to the work I'm showing here. As you might imagine at this point, I'm inexplicably drawn to people's bizarre material collections. When a gallerist I work with wrote me an email back in late 2012 about a peculiar band looking to give away thousands of 35 millimeter photographic slides, I was obviously intrigued. The band was the Trachtenberg family slideshow players. <laughs> the Trachtenbergs were a kooky New York City based pop band that used found family slideshows as inspiration for their music. I reached out to Jason Trachtenberg, the father, about the 35 millimeter slides and then visited him in their apartment in Bushwick, Brooklyn. According to Jason, the band had an illustrious career, touring around the country for almost a decade and even making an appearance on Conan O'Brien. Just to give you a taste of the Trachtenbergs, right now I'm going to play a brief clip of that performance. My next guests are a uh, unique family act who purchase vintage slides from random estate sales and thrift shops and make up songs about the people in them. You can also pick up their self-titled CD, Trachtenberg Family Slideshow Players, Volume 1. Please welcome the Trachtenberg Family Slideshow Players. Hello, tonight's song is called Look At Me. It's based on the lives of two retired military nurses from Seattle who are named Jean and Cappy. The song tells their story as they grow old together throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s and do Seattle kind of things such as go to the Festival of Gas. It goes something like this. One, two, three, one. Look at me. Here we are in the parking lot. My friends cough because they smoke a lot. Look at me. Against 
the car. Chiropractic can fix you there when you're sunny and share, sunny and share. Look at me. Look at this. A government disc. Only music can set us free. For your President Kennedy. Look at me. All right, that's enough of that, right? You, you get the idea. Um, by the time I met them, the family was no longer performing together. Instead of playing in a band with her parents, their now almost 20-year-old daughter was in her own girl band and was looking to move out of the family apartment. Reluctant to let this happen, the parents consolidated their belongings and gave her the bigger bedroom. Part of this transition included giving away their massive slide collection. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time to inherit it. I left in Trachtenberg's apartment that day with numerous blue IKEA bags stuffed full of random 35 millimeter slides. I hadn't the slightest idea what I wanted to do with them. Regardless, I knew I had something special. A collection, of powerfully, a collection with a powerfully weird backstory rich in history and full of potential. There had to be the seeds of a project in there somewhere. I started looking at the slides by holding them to the light, you know, just to get an idea what type of content was on there. At some point, I upgraded my viewing method after my mom dug up an old slide viewer with a battery-operated backlight and a 12x magnification lens. It wasn't too long before I ended up loading two slides into the viewer at the same time. When I combined two slides that complemented each other, a newer, stranger story emerged. <laughs> <laughs> Through trial and error, and with a healthy dose of patience, I learned, to mu I learned to merge multiple images. In order to do so successfully, I had to pay particular attention to their compositions, relative transparencies, and visual content. I find it to be an interesting approach to collage. Normally, collage is a deliberate process in which visual elements are extracted from various sources and then recombined in a new and novel arrangement. It's a controlled and manipulated system. My 35 millimeter slide collages are a different beast entirely. Instead of subtracting unwanted material from the source imagery, the original content is left whole and unaltered. When I combine two slides together, the composite image includes every bit of information from both original slides. I don't give myself the option to make alterations. Without that control, I'm left with a different set of choices. It's a binary decision process. Either it works or it doesn't. If it doesn't work, I keep searching for a better pairing. In this way, serendipity plays an important role. By now I've collected maybe 15,000 slides. Considering this quantity of potential imagery, what are the chances that I happen to find and try two specific slides that pair so well together? One thing I noticed early on when sharing these collages was that people identified with the imagery in very interesting and personal ways. My own personal read on any particular composition was irrelevant because each observer developed their own uniquely imaginative take. I discovered an invaluable artistic medium that invited people in and encouraged them to see what they wanted to see rather than what they thought the artist wanted them to see. Through this crack in the door, I saw a new project emerging. What if I could push people a step further? Instead of telling me a surface level read of a collage at an art opening, Maybe I could get them to sit down and write a story that would bring that collage to life. I beta tested the idea a few times with a good friend, Brandon Kaplan, who was getting his MFA in creative writing. The initial results were fantastic. I was so excited about the collaboration that I, I decided to bring in more writers and create a book to compile their stories and document the project. After three years, I'd collected 38 stories written by 29 different authors. 
I even contributed a story myself, even though I was opposed to it for a long time. In my opinion, I was fulfilling my end of the collaboration by supplying the inspiration and by producing the book. I was eventually convinced, and I'm glad I was, because it helped me better un understand the difficulty of my ask and the generous enthusiasm and beautiful creativity of my authors. With all the content on hand, I reached out to a group of friends to help on the production, editing, and printing of the book. The end result is a stunning 100-page book that was published in late 2018. Getting back to the work that's currently on display here, when Bruce Brown asked me if I wanted to show in a yet-to-open, highly anticipated Portland gallery, I jumped at the opportunity. To rise to the occasion, I wanted to try out a few new things. For the longest time, I'd been a purist when it came to presenting the work. I preferred showing the collages in vintage viewers because in that form, they have more dimension and the experience is more personal. While most people agreed with me, others still wanted to see them at a larger scale. For this show in particular, I knew that the massive gallery space demanded large format work. I took the plunge and produced 20 photographic prints on aluminum using a process called dye sublimation. Now many of you have asked me what, what exactly is dye sublimation, so I want to quickly go over that. Dye sublimation is a printing method that relies on the unique physical properties of special inks that enter a gaseous state when heat and pressure are applied. The desired image is printed onto transfer paper, which is then laid on top of a substrate whose surface is covered in a thin polymer coating. When the two sandwich layers are placed in a heat press, the pores of the polymer coating open up, allowing the gaseous ink to penetrate the surface. The end result is a more durable product with a high fidelity image. Also for this show, I wanted to upgrade the presentation of my vintage viewers. To add additional intrigue, I constructed unique display shelves that enhance the experience by suggesting a visual conversation with the contents of the associated slide collage. In this way, I got to incorporate a taste of my more sculptural, materially resourceful sensibilities. All the materials used in the shelves were previously collected and found in my studio. While well, I've talked you through my various bodies of work in the context of the linear arc of my art career, I don't want to imply that I ever really leave any body of work behind. That is, unless I'm truly out of a material. I dip in and out of projects, returning to older work when I see an opportunity to reinvest or reinvent. Since the Blister Pact exhibition, the components from that project were recycled to become the set for a dance performance. Other parts were later used to create a multimedia interactive installation at the Harlow Gallery in Hallowell, Maine, just earlier this year. My spores, as you saw, continue to accumulate and get installed in ever more complex arrangements. To that note, I plan to make a new suspended spore installation for an upcoming 2020 solo show at Common Street Arts in Waterville. And someday, in the not-too-distant future, I hope to create a second volume of the Strange Histories book. Since completing the first book, I've gotten interest, interest from other friends, collectors, writers, and artists that would like to contribute and collaborate. That about does it for my presentation. Uh, if you'd like to see more of my work, please check out my website, where you can, fee where you can see a lot more examples of what I've shown you today. Uh, now I'd like to open up the floor to any questions that you might have. I can't say I really grew up with a lot of quilts around, so I don't I don't know if if they had an impact. the the blister pack The blister pack project was probably the most quilt-like thing I made. I mean, literally every package was stitched to the neighboring package with about eight different little pieces of wire. So the amount of work that went into that was. 
pretty incredible. Um, I, I decided to use the, the wire threads for that piece specifically because I had to build it in sized panels that would easily fit in a moving truck, so four by eight roughly. And I knew there was a lot of like rough handling that went into moving those pieces. And I figured if I tried to glue it together, I could only, I, I just envisioned a nightmare on like installation week, trying to hang this piece and all those plastic welds just breaking on me and the, the thread, threading it together, stitching it together was actually a pretty resilient attachment process. And do you have to rent a storage unit? Uh, that, that piece right now is, uh, essentially pulled out, it's like, it's all hanging from the ceiling of my studio. <laughs> um, some of it's actually, when I first moved here, my wife and I were sharing my studio, she was working out of it as well. And I, I used part of it to create a dust shield between the two, so it's actually, uh, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of all over the place. Right now I haven't returned it to its rightful hanging spot on the ceiling after the, the Hallowell show, it's just sitting in a big pile in the middle of my studio. Not as actively, but I still collect it. Like every time I see one, I, I just, there's like, there's, there's an urge, yeah. Um, especially now, like as recycling in Maine, the, the landscape of recycling in Maine is changing. Like not all transfer stations are starting to accept this material. So I feel like in the future, there's probably some, pu some future project that involves that because it's, it's even more relevant now than it might have been in the past. Mm -hmm. um, one is, have you gotten any feedback from some of like, your viewers as to like, um, whether or not you actually did create awareness for them? And kind of, like, are you aware of any impact that you had with your artwork? And my second question is, did you end up joining, like, have you ever thought about joining up with like, any, like, I don't know, green organization or you know, clean earth organization or anything along those lines? What, what was the first question again? The first question Um, uh, oh, about pollution? Yeah, or like, you know, the way that like, people just discard things carelessly. Well, I mean, I think everyone's, people's willingness to keep giving me things is sort of the, the indication that you're asking for. Like, yeah. I mean, just, just the other day, a friend of mine wrote me trying to give me more slides. Like, I, I get messages from people all the time being like, do you, do you want me to come bring, by this, bring this stuff by your studio? Um, Actually, the, the influx of material is, at this point, is greater than I can even handle. There's an entire corner of my studio that looks like a garbage pile because I've been a little too distracted this summer to get to it. Um, and then the second question? Uh, the second question was, like, have you ever, like, had an opportunity to join up with, like, I don't know, like a clean earth movement or something like that? Like, have you ever thought about it? I've worked some, I've shown with, um, I've shown some work on a website that's dedicated to um, reusing plastic packaging. So any, any piece that's sold through that website, 50% goes to cleaning up beaches for like whichever, whichever organization the artist chooses, generally something local to their own, their own practice. I think I like having, having a bit of a container. You know, like one reason I've never really been super drawn to drawing or painting is sort of this idea of starting with a complete, completely blank surface. Like that process always kind of terrifies me. My, my mind goes blank just looking at it. Um, I need to start with something physical, I feel like, to see inspiration. And having the container of a frame, I think, helps me do that. I've actually, I've been told kind of later, since I moved to Maine, that someone was saying that like, maybe I rely too heavily on wooden frames. Like it's kind of something that I've used a lot of in the past. And she was saying, I see so much of your work involves frames. Why not try to get away from that a little bit? Um, 
but I still see I still see wood molding as a material source that I have a lot of. So why why would I stop using it? <coughs> Mm -hmm. um, it's a good question. I've I recently built uh, I've been framing again some smaller samples of the plastic packaging, and I did one where I actually bought an LED light strip and built it into the frame. I like the result, but again, I feel a little bit uncertain about that aspect of buying this material to embellish the piece. Um, while I had blister packed up at the Brooklyn Gallery, uh, I had a friend come over one evening with a projector and just start playing with projecting imagery onto the package. And it was so much fun. I just really loved the impact because the light hits the package and you can see some of the projection on the surface, but it actually goes through that surface and hits the wall behind it. So you get all these interesting distortions of the curves from the plastic. And it actually um, inspired a bit of the collaboration that I had at the Harlow Gallery in the spring I worked with artist Andrew Elijah Edwards, who does a lot of digital imagery and a lot of digital video. And uh, one of sort of the central components of that show was an array of these blister packs that I had hung, including some singular packages and other styrofoam, and then he projected video onto that. And it was pretty fun and dynamic. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I tend to think it's, I mean, it, does, it doesn't like impact my creative process, but I think in general it impacts the way I see the world in and of itself. And I think that's kind of the more important take home message from that education is that I see humans as just another organism on the planet and we need to live within that ecosystem. So that kind of informs why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, but all those years working in labs, you know, you're good at working with your hands, you're good at being patient, you're good at following instructions. So as you can see, a lot of the work I make is very time consuming and probably pretty boring from an outside perspective. Um, cutting up cardboard into small squares about a million times and then poking holes and stringing it all together sort of involves that sort of methodical processing that I think I helped, that I, that I picked up working in labs. Yep. It seems like there's an opportunity to tell, to uh, instruct children to do the same thing and inspire people to do more of that. So mm -hmm. it seems like there's a great opportunity for uh, budding artists, or future artists, to, to use pollution as, as art. And there might be you know, greater movement that you could create out of this from, your, from inspiring. I, remember, I, mean, I know you went to some schools to do some of that, but it seems like it could be really developed in a greater way. Mm -hmm. Is that anything you consider? Uh, I do. I think one of my major hang-ups with that is I, I, talking in front of people isn't my favorite thing to do, so sort of being in that position deliberately makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but I've, I've definitely done plenty of that beyond working with the school. I've done birthday parties. Uh, I did a couple other events where I made um, caterpillar puppets out of like shredded paper and cardboard and wire. and. Um, Actually, the, there's a museum in New York dedicated to children's art, or it's not children's art, but it's a museum for children to, to kind of educate them about art. And actually, I got an email from them earlier in the summer saying that they had designed a lesson plan around my spore project and was going to do sort of a, a week seminar with the kids using that as, as inspiration. So even if I'm not doing it personally, it's good to know that the work is out there and kind of doing some of the work for me. Mm -hmm. Have you um, received, are there any materials that you've gotten a lot of that you haven't done anything yet? Or are there any materials that you kind of get sometimes that you're, you like think you would want to use for something else? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the spore project, um, so when I, I made all those suspended spores for the, the Brockman Gallery, 
I think at that point, I went through all, a lot of the stuff that I had been saving but never used and just started to consume it all. Because um, really, like I said, not everything is, is that fascinating right away. Um, and it just kind of, it gets stuck somewhere in my studio and I don't find it till later. But that one project just really demanded so much physical material that I just started to really dig through it all and just sort of indiscriminately just start binding it up, you know. Um, because at that point, nothing is really all that precious, you know. Um, it's only precious if I make it into something more interesting. So I try not to look at some materials as being too valuable um, for a potential project, and I need to be able to sort of let go of that value so I can do what I want with it without trying to find or create a specific value out of it. <laughs> 